Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, first of all, I want to just thank and acknowledge the work of Senator Regina Doherty, Lisa Chambers and Pauline O'Reilly for moving this bill. I doubt that I'm the only member, and it's been referenced already in here, uh, to believe that if we didn't have female leadership, women leading um, on the government side of the chamber, we wouldn't see legislation like this make its way through the House. Um, so you are to be commended for that. Um, and it's a sad state of affairs that, it's, that, that that's how we have to get stuff done, but you just got to get women in, you got to get women to do it, and that's how it is. Um, and this is a really difficult topic. It's a hard topic, it's a hard topic for some of us in here. I know it's a hard topic for people who might be watching in, or listening in on this, or maybe reading about it. It's, going to be, it's a difficult topic, but it's a really important topic, and I want to particularly commend you for the sensitivity and the way that you have dealt with this topic. Yeah. Um, it is, as I said, it's hard and you have de dealt with it with great compassion, sensitivity and kindness. Um, and that's not often something that we see in politics. Um, and this is, uh, I just think it's really great for such a difficult, difficult, difficult topic. Um, I, I was talking to actually uh, our, our former Shannon colleague, uh, Dow Deputy Ivana Batchik, and she's talking about how in 1998 she was doing research for the Dublin Ray Crisis Centre. Um, around this and that ended up resulting in previous legislation around the right of legal representation for complainants in sex offence trials where the defence seeks to produce evidence of prior sexual experience. You know, and we still see stuff around that but like it's a conversation that has required women over the years constantly to be trying to push for, for care and compassionate change that, that doesn't re-traumatise or make things more difficult. Um, I, I note um, just it's interesting when we talk about um, re-victimisation or re-traumatisation um, as if it's only sometimes at this point in a trial that that happens. I know I can certainly speak from a, a very personal experience, you know, when you hear jokes, you know, there's a scene on a TV when we read about stuff that's happening over in the Ukraine and the women who are being raped in Ukraine, when you see social media pylons denying uh, victims' testimony and saying that it's not true, like it's, it's never something that's a re-victimisation at one point of a trial or at one point. It's something that consistently happens. And as, you know, if someone has been raped, that is a part of their life. Um, you know, and, and something I think hopefully that will go beyond this is actually how we do talk about rape, how we talk about victims, how it is portrayed in the media, how it is portrayed in you know, TV and stuff like that. And I think there's a much more compassionate, sensitive way that this can be dealt with. And I hope when we, we see legislation like this that that challenges those people who, who, who talk about it in a way that I think maybe is not the most uh, compassionate or, or the most thoughtful. Um, it's not, uh, I remember last November when we had a really constructive, uh, respectful and some, as I said, very personal discussion when the report from the Justice Committee came um, on victims' testimony in uh, cases of rape and sexual assault. Mm. So it's great that in less than five months we've seen legislation seeking to take the need to protect victims against, as we talked about, re-victimisation. Um, and I hope that we continue this progress uh, to make our justice system more cognizant of the needs of victims. Um, you talked about changing a culture that puts um, victims on trial. Um, and I think that's one of the key things here. Um, when we hear about glowing references, and it's been mentioned here, of having to listen to that, to having to sit down and listen to someone speak so highly of someone who has done one of the most heinous, horrific, things to another person, maybe not even to one other person, to many, many people we don't know, you know, and I can't even comprehend what that would be like to have to sit there and listen to that because I chose not to go through that, you know, and I've spoken in here before about this where, you know, I went through the process, I reported to the guards, I went to the Satu clinic, I did everything that I had to do, and before I'd even left the door, uh, a guard was talking to me, effectively a character reference of that person, how they'd heard that this person, um, and someone had said to them that, you know, we've never done anything like this before. I was like, did that, did last night. Um, and before I'd even gotten out the door, there was, you know, a character reference happening. And I knew that there was absolutely and utterly no way that I was going to be able to go through, even if it was chosen by, you know, the DPP to be prosecuted, which seemed unlikely given the circumstances. There was absolutely and utterly no way I was going to be able to go through a trial. And there was absolutely and utterly no way if a male guard has said to me, you wouldn't do this, that I was going to be able to sit there and listen to what was inevitably going to be lots and lots of people saying, 
he didn't do it, it was your fault, are you sure this actually happened? Um, so I can't imagine what it is like for those victims to have to sit there for those character references. I think it must be one of the most, again, as I say this as someone who's, who's been through this experience and has supported friends through it and supported friends through that trial process, to have to listen to people defend someone who did that and their good name, and then to say that they deserve less of less of time, less of a, a slap on the wrist for something that they did, which we have to live with for the rest of our lives. We have to live with the scars of that in our bodies. We have to live with that experience for the rest of their lives. And I really just want to commend you for really taking the initiative with this because, as I said, I don't know how people do that. And I wish I'd had the strength to do that. I wish I'd had the strength that I'd be able to stand up here today and say that I did that so that other people would be able to do it. Um, but I wasn't able to at the time. Um, and I hope that this sends a message to people that they are going to be believed, that this farcical situation of people lining up and saying what a great person they are when they've done such a terrible thing will hopefully end and we just have a justice system that is based on evidence, mm. truth, innocence, guilt, and doesn't put a victim through something that I cannot imagine going through. So thank you so much. Thank you. Senator Hoy, thank you for sharing your story and I think unfortunately it's the story of so many which talks about the importance of this piece of legislation uh, and as you pointed out it is because of the leadership uh, and the predominantly female leadership of uh, the Shannon Aaron in terms of the seven leaders, the majority are women that this legislation and other legislation like it is coming through at this time um, and long delayed in many instances.